Happens. All right, it is live. I should probably share that. Copy. And uh, we are live. We are live. Episode 53. Just like Route 53. Just like DNS. Just like DNS. Yeah. 53, the DNS episode. There you go. That's how it goes. There, there we go. It's tweeted. You can retweet it. We should probably intro ourselves now. Uh, all right, cool. Got everything ready. Tom and Xavier here with How They Got Hacked, episode 53. Woohoo! <laughs> yes. And Dave, we, we, we start this show before we start the show, and then we keep getting off topic. We've been already talking for a while, and we're like, hey, we got to hit record. And uh, right, once we right, set all yeah. the stuff, and we are now we can no longer sing names to protect the innocent or not so right. innocent or. Uh, <laughs> Lack thereof, innocence. <laughs> innocence, yeah. lack thereof. La innocence, lack thereof, and things like that. So now that all that's in the clear, um, the first thing Xavier started talking about, and I said, guest date for the rest of the show, is he's got a badge. Oh, yeah. And can anyone guess? Yeah, let's see. Who do we have? Let's see. What do, what do we have here? Uh, do we have anyone live in the chat? Just People are still guess. doing it because we did not plan this well enough, but... Oh, I like that too. <laughs> Ooh. I want that. Stickers. I love stickers. So it looks like I have a DEF CON safe mode badge right here. Nice. B is for B side. You already know it. Mm hmm. DEF CON 28. Uh, something or the other there. I'm not sure what that's about. I'm pretty sure I have to like decode it all and get it sorted. Well, yeah, my DEF CON like badge it. came. This is the yeah. badge for this year. Here's my lanyard. It's a lanyard. The badge is a cassette tape, so awesome. Yep. So DEF CON, woo We're uh, ramping up. Super excited. It's always a fun time of year uh, when DEF CON is among us. And Xavier's doing the Car Hacking Village this year, so. Yes, I am doing the Car Hacking Village. I have a, a talk there, and I am co-organizing, so. Super, super. And they're hacking a Tesla, but not my Tesla. <laughs> yes, we are hacking multiple cars, actually. And we'll yes. have a live CTF over the internet um, that you can connect to. Uh, actually, here, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, it's at virtual.carhackingvillage.com. Oh, uh, very cool. Here, I'll share my screen. Here you go. And this is a little sneak peek, a little taste, um, kind of digging into the tutorial. This will teach you exactly how to start getting into the actual CTF and how it all works. Um, but yeah, I don't want to spoil too much. Take the time. Go check that out. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's really cool. That's all that's set up, too. There's a lot of work that goes in the back end making all this work. And uh, it's why yes. Xavier has not produced a lot of other content. This is... Uh, oh, yeah. It's been taking up a lot of uh, energy. But, you know, not only this, uh, you know, trying to drive the business, get everything in order. It, it's one of those things, too. It's uh, be careful what you say yes to because... <laughs> It, yeah. it sounds like funny, like, oh, it's actually work. <laughs> no, yeah, it's work for sure. It's rewarding, but, though. It's nice. It is. It's, it's fun. I'm it's like excited. it is. I, I'm, and, and it, I'm, I'm excited new about friends, it. Like new lifelong like, friends, too. Like people who I could say, yo, remember that time we did the one thing? Remember like when the world was ending and we still decided to do this conference? And it was, yep. you know, like it's super amazing. I'm like so blessed to be able to bring us to the people and allow people to learn about car hacking and uh yeah super excited absolutely all Speaking right of capture the flag def con yes official Pull that up. this is cool flag. this is Every actually what i made the thumbnail for our thing for those wondering what the thumbnail is about it's this i described yeah. a screenshot of this uh site this is really cool so every year def con has a, a famous capture the flag that of course we all know and love if we're hackers um and it looks like now this year, uh, and I'm not sure if this is the first year or if it's always been here, but from what I can tell, uh, you know, Tom, Tom brought this to me. It looks like this is a live version of all of the old DEF CON CTF challenges. So, uh, you know, seems pretty cool. You can 
kind of dig in here and play around with uh with you can read the hints in there to get you started on them and things like that yep. so yeah it's super super cool uh i'm gonna be playing with it i've never played with it before i don't really know exactly how it works but it looks like you can some servers you know it's gonna be happening it's really really that's it's dope right i want to be playing with this in my spare time yeah i like to uh i like to i like to has the funds yeah the the ctf stuff is fun is a good learning spot to uh hone your skills on it and you know it's funny because someone had commented on my youtube channel and my tour videos oh i want to get into hacking i really need to be secure to do this i'm like stop if you if you are having to hide your ip address or something else to get started in this you're probably doing something illegal you don't want to do it there's literally better legal places to start that will still hone your skills that can train you to be eventually a pen tester a red teamer um, or on the other side, working defense, because you gain a better understanding of how this works. But there's legal ways to do this now more than there ever was growing up. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. More than there ever was even just uh, five years. Ago. Yeah. yeah. You, you won't go, go back very far at all to that. So, And then like when you have people like TJ Null, who actually take the time to do a prep guides for things like the PWK and OSCP, and uh you know actually having the ability to help you along the list along the line of you know, what books what courses you should be taking um you know the the essential tools and like these are all links to not only you know one place for him to send you to his employer or whatever you know one of his sponsors is this is so that you could actually learn you know how this stuff works and this is even for me it's really really good to come here and you know poke around and see hey when's the last time i checked out you know is mx toolbox even updated like when's the last time that they've updated oh look it's just nice and simple right um i should punch tom's address in there (laughs) 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 see if i can have some fun it's always dns it's always dns it's always dns um but anyway, yeah, there's just more and more resources becoming available that are organized, right? Like, you know, coming up, we had resources and legal and legal. And another thing is there's these abilities to kind of spin up your own lab, right? So like you can make your own, you know, lab that allows you to be able to go out and, and do some of this hacking, right? So um, TJ No also put together something that he calls the, the Vaughn Hub VM list. And these are similar to the OSCP, and uh, you know he's he's put this together for us to be able to go through and download all of these for free, and spin these up in our virtual box. And this is updated as of March 2020, so you know it's with the latest and greatest uh, version of the OSCP as well. And yeah, you're gonna have you some fun. Very cool. Legally. Oh, we do have some hacking news because, well, yes. the, ha- the the people doing the illegal stuff did not take a break. But I like this vigilante, though, I'm going to say. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so there is a person out in the world who knows about uh, the Amotet situation and decided to take things into their own hands. Um, it, this is great. It seems like they are replacing the payloads that otherwise would be dropped by the Emotet botnet with gifts. And uh, yeah, I mean, literally just dropping gifts <laughs> to prevent victims from getting infected instead of dropping the actual payload, which would be infecting. Um, it seems like just three days ago, well, not three days ago anymore. Well, yeah, it is three, three days ago, July 21st, um, some white hat hackers were uh, tracking the Motet botnet, and uh, seems like now some vigilante is knocking off at least 25% of all the Motet payloads, and that's a large portion of traffic. Um, this is that's... probably like some kind of insider threat on a spreader kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and it could be, you know, to the benefit, it could be that the people that are doing the illegal things with Motet made angry one of the people involved in it and he says right. you know what i'm gonna do <laughs> i'm right. gonna go I'm mess with your uh, everything else so yeah <laughs> and, you know and because we understand how the motet botnet is working we understand that i mean they this was one of the first as a service 
model um, malwares. And so we know that Emotet was being used by multiple groups and it became more of a mode of operation than even just a particular payload. And so the fact that like someone is either A, hacked or compromised someone who is uh, in that network of trusted individuals who have access to the Emotet botnet, um, or we actually have someone who has figured out how to compromise, uh, you know, the actual, the, the, you know, the spreading mechanism of Emotet and figured out a way to potentially nullify it. Um, and it's just testing things out for, for future use, right? 25%. It's a large amount. I mean, we could see this spike up to 50, 75, and then it'll be very apparent that Emotet will either have to change the way that it's going about things or go away forever. And, you know, that's kind of what we're hoping for. Motet's been causing hell for the last two and a half years, maybe three years now. Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting because it's gone through a lot of iterations. Uh, it's gone through a lot of updates and optimization. It's code base. It's still called a Motet, but it's evolved quite a bit over the years. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. It, I mean, it's changed its payloads multiple times, almost like every six months it actually changed. And uh, it's essentially payload. considered the precursor to the attack. You start seeing the Emotet on the network and you're like, it's about to happen. Like, get your get ready, brace for impact. Shit's about to go down. And it looks like, I mean, uh, from here, it seems that uh, it was silent for more than five months, which could mean a number of things. I remember when I, when we first talked about how Emotet's kind of quieted off, I thought, hey, maybe this meant that this was an operation that was outside of the U.S. and COVID, you know, COVID struck. But then COVID kind of ramped, ramped down. Like it wasn't like a, it was like a turndown of COVID in a lot of places outside of the U.S. The U.S. is kind of the last place that's ramped up. The motel was still fairly quiet, which is kind of showing the hand, right? Or was Emotet basically uh, hoping that always, you know, or leveraging some kind of connectivity inside of a network or something, right? When people made the shift to work from home, did controls change? Did what change that made people not click links anymore or, or what, right? Like, why did Emotet decide to go away? These are like questions, of course. Um, there's no way that we're going to answer these questions, but. These are the things that come to my mind, like what makes a botnet, you know, master decide, oh, I want to take five months off. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty like aggressive, you know, for, unless they have some other stream of income, maybe they're owned by another, maybe Emotet is another group as well. Yeah. Or they could just be that they are sitting on some cash from doing this. So, uh, yeah, definitely a possibility in there. You never know. <laughs> but it looks like Emotet is is getting gifified. <laughs> oh man, you guys! I'm okay it. with that. Yeah, I mean, hey, it almost makes me want to go stand up a honeypot just to uh, just collect some James Franco just gifts. To get, just to get some nice gifts in the collection. I like this know? one. This is Ackerman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Defacements are a impacting Emotet activity. That's good. I yeah. like when white hats punch back. Um, I'll be honest with you. Everybody and if they do it in a funny to... way that just tickles us, you know what I mean? For sure. Everybody likes to act like, you know, the black hat hackers are always so cool and yada, yada. And hey, I'll be honest. We all should be revering them and making sure that black hat hackers are, you know, inside of their cup of, of chaos, right? Mm -hmm. But in reality, we shouldn't be aspiring to be like them or, or glorifying them. We should be working really, really hard to understand them and their tools, techniques, and procedures, and then stopping them, right? So somebody took the time to look at how Emotet operates and start to peel back those layers and figured out a way to at least stop 20, a quarter of all affections, which I'll be honest, that's, that's it's good. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Sorry, I yawned. <laughs> <laughs> I've only started. been here since seven. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So, uh, you know, let's be honest. How much does it cost to get a uh, a CD back online? Oh, a lot. Looks yeah. like maybe around how much in ransom? Uh, I don't know about ransoms, but I mean, like, uh, and and let's be let's be honest, right? We don't know exactly 
you know, from from business to business, corp to corp, exactly how much these ransoms are. But I mean, we've seen them from as low as ten, twenty thousand dollars to as high as quarters of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Quarter million dollars. Yeah. And at one city, uh, Kaiser, um, where is Kaiser based out of? They're not even telling me. It just says Kaiser Times. Here, I'll share my uh, my screen here. So in Kaiser, uh, there were, uh, of course, some hackers got in, did a little RW, and uh, looks like they actually asked for a $48,000 ransom payment uh, for the keys, right? And it seems like so far, they've already paid at least $60,000 uh, to recover totally from the hack. So not too crazy, right? But I mean, $48,000 in one payment we kind of start to see just how much uh, a city's data is worth to some groups. Um, it looks like they're going to be taking, you know, some some very uh, modern approaches, such as Sentinel One, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Let's be honest; like, you know, that's what they got to do. Of course, cyber insurance is is uh, covering plus two percent transaction fee. You know, uh, yeah pretty interesting of course it looks like the players right will be getting paid in between 10 to fifteen thousand dollars. and i'll be honest this is like a low end it doesn't even seem like an expensive attack but you start to see exactly how just how much goes into this you're talking about a 36 month subscription for 160 computers at 12.5 for single one just off the top right plus the payment of the ransom plus two percent of the payment of the ransom um forensics to be done was just 36 right and then yeah, just get you an idea hackers, how much forensics costs <laughs> right and just the payment of the ransom was 48 so everybody is just like grabbing at this company's you know pocketbook basically um seems like city computers are almost completely up and running but there may be additional costs they look like they want to do two factor which is very very smart um they're using bombcastic which i don't know why they decided to put this into like this is not a good thing to put into your uh your press release about getting hacked like by the way we use comcast like oh oh okay well i know where you can't have 2fa the person on the phone right like you may be but we'll yeah see. but it's not too hard to osynth that information you know quick uh-huh. little quick search you figure out who's using what pretty quick but of yeah. course i mean yeah. But either it it goes both ways because this discussion came up the other day of how companies don't reveal their infrastructure, but you can figure out who works there, look at the search they have, or as soon as they post on ZipRecruiter Jobs. or any of the hiring sites, Jobs. hey, look, we're we're not saying what infrastructure we have, but here's a list of search we'd like to have. Uh, yeah, oh, we'd okay, like a so now Golang we developer with four plus years experience, someone who knows Vue.js. And right. we'd like a Swift developer. You're like, hmm, I wonder if they have a Swift iOS app with a Vue.js front end for the website and, and a Golang backend. <laughs> and an example I've given too, people said, well, PFSense isn't used in the commercial markets. I'm like, uh, mm-hmm. ever heard of Visa MasterCard? You know, a little, right. little company out there. Um, they were, I posted a video where they were showed their zip recorder. They're looking specifically for PFSense experienced people at Makes their sense. data centers. Put two and two together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's not a commercial product that also, if you're familiar with PF Sense specifically, what they were looking for, you're familiar with other things. I mean, exactly. it's when they have the ask, and they didn't say, "Are you a Cisco firewall person?" They didn't ask if you're a Palo Alto firewall person. They said, "Are you a Cisco or are you a PF Sense firewall person?" You've made a very specific ask for a reason, right. and they're <laughs> different. They are very different. They're I'll very know. different. No. Played, yeah, I they may function the same way, but they didn't ask if you have experience in it because they weren't using it. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. Have you heard about this uh, this meow attack? I, I seen it because I love the name and I bookmarked meow. I should read that. And then I didn't. Meow. So, so uh, remember when they found out about that UFO VPN stuff? Yeah. Uh, with the, the whole database um, being exposed? Well, um, there was basically a follow-up to that. Apparently, the UFO VPN people had uh, uh, a database that was, like, destroyed, 
like like unrecoverable, right? And so it seems like potentially these people were the, the quote unquote the meow attackers. Ah. Uh, they were supposedly behind it. So I'm gonna share my screen here and get you guys up to speed on the meow attack um, and how it's nuked over 1,000 databases without even like saying anything um, other than meow. No. Meow. Well, typical uh, hacker. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> cats, right? Who doesn't <laughs> like cats? Uh, it's like literally just leaving the word meow as his calling card. So uh, remember on Home Alone, when they stuffed all of the, the stuff in the sink and they turned on the, the faucets and he was like, what are you doing? And he's like, that's our calling card. You know, we're, we're flooding the houses or whatever they were. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were like plumbers, disgruntled plumbers or some shit. Um, yeah. But yeah, it the, the seems that, um, you know, just for fun, as they're calling it, seems like uh, since the, uh, the UFO situation, they've already destroyed more than 1,000 other databases. Um, you know, we're talking about over 987 elastic searches. Um, here, let's see if I can pop some of this. Well, up there. honestly, if they go around DVDs. and delete these, so um, now we're up to 2,000. Now we're not going to have as many to talk about From every time someone discovers an open one. <laughs> right. True. Because they're undoubtedly destroying them because it's you know uh, bad default creds, wide open. I wonder. Anyway, the 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 um the elastic cache is or elastic search, excuse me, elastic is just wide open and being basically deleted with a bunch of meows. Yeah, they just have all the meows left. Meow meows. Man, that sucks. I would be so frustrated. Like, man. And it's just like indiscriminate, like from Byron Yeah, probably just a bot running around doing this. Hong Kong to the Netherlands to Indonesia to Iran and the US at the ocean. Meow, 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 meow. Oh, man, that sucks. All the way over to Russia with meow, meows. Oof. Makes me want to go check my database. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, most of the time, I mean, we don't. It's not a security flaw as much as it is just, just shit left. Having open. it exposed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? And you should have this type of stuff. The mitigation is. Private networking. Have yep. this without a public IP address that only trust, you know, uh, you know, do all your communications on 10 dots or some other private IP addresses and make a trust boundary, like make a route only, like something like that using networking. Meows. Um, they're just doing this for the lows, it looks like. Uh, yep. We've seen plenty of people just do shit for the laws. It doesn't seem like they're money motivated. They probably could have ransomed these folks and got plenty enough money, but it seems like they're just in it for the meow meows. In it for the meow meows. <laughs> they, just like the, they just like the cats. Carrie is live. Is compromised and streaming BTC scams. Oh, BTC scams. Oh, boy. Oh, I'm not about to go do that one. That's nuts. Yeah, who is What's going on, everybody? How's oh, everybody is it doing YouTube today? channel? Uh, maybe. Let's see. Okay, it's a gamer or something like that. Oh, it looks, looks like. like a gamer. Oh man, you got hacked, huh? Oh 6. well, 6. wow million. that that's not just a gaming channel. That's a gaming channel with six point six million subscribers. Tangled I don't follow gaming down. channels, so I didn't know didn't know who they were. But yeah, wow. So. Tangled down. Greg Live says, I wonder hacked, how Garmin huh? is doing today. Well, they're it's lost. Funny you, it's funny you ask that because the next story that we're covering right now is, <laughs> uh, is exactly about that. Um, they need Garmin, to find their way back to security. <laughs> there you go. I, I knew it was coming. I, only a dad could have the dad jokes locked. We got to get the there. dad jokes in on this one. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Garmin <laughs> ransomware attack. They're out of there. Now, uh, to to their to be fair, Garmin has very 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 good um, data retention on their devices, so it'll download all that stuff. And no matter if they're up or down, you're not gonna get lost. Like you're good as long as GPS is online. They got the data they need for the most part on the handhelds um, or on the systems most of the time. But it looks like Garmin, who is being noted as a smartwatch and wearable maker, um, has been shut down. Uh, 
yeah, that's really, really rough. Uh, ransomware, encrypted internal and production. Um, they mean a mess of it all. They're dealing with multi-day maintenance uh, to deal with that. I mean, we're talking about Garmin Connect, which does all this user uh, data, the syncing all the way to its aviation databases, even some stuff over in Asia. Um, they're having a really, really hard time. So Garmin you know, and is, this is uh, having a good, good day. Because it uh, affects our call centers are currently unable to receive calls, which, you know, it's a challenge because we were talking about uh, earlier today some of the – the trend I'm seeing for more and more devices to have some level of activation online, one that forces a product life cycle of whenever they turn off the activation server Two, if that company has some type of incident, now you can't do things like right here to all the people freaking out about Garmin and Garmin fitness services have been down seven plus hours. Um, mount your watch USB on your computer. Oh, so there's, there's challenges that come with it directly because of this. Take today's .fit file, manually upload it to a third-party service. Oh, nice. That's pretty cool. At least they're open, right? Like, that's the openness and the inter interoperability, right? Yeah. Like, we like that. If you're going to go down, well, at least you got a way for me to be able to mount my device and grab off a file and upload it somewhere else. That is so cool. Not only from the fact that you let me go and get that off of my device, which Apple would never. Let's throw that out there. I love Apple. But they would never let me want to mount my watch. No, they ever. they literally like to lock you into their <laughs> ecosystem, your data, and everything gets locked up with it. So that's nice. Data liberation is a is a huge factor on any of these products. But yeah, that's uh, quite a big mess. Ooh. Yeah, this US they've been reporting reports this reports for a little while. Oh, this is back are, from July six. Like oh, we know. every government agency is basically saying, "Look, the IT industry is under attack. It's just on fire." Yeah, everything's on fire. That's. <laughs> I just had to. I just had to come in. Yeah. A shout out to to our bro Kyle over at Huntress. I remember when you were first uh, talking about about this earlier this month. Yeah, they, it, the whole thing's just like a uh, absolute persistent Dump, mess. A dumpster fire. Yeah. Uh, bad day. Well, good day for some folks. Bad day for others. Oh, there's a bunch um, of security researchers got a good payday coming. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, a so, twenty five thousand dollar forensics bills on its way, or they're a big company. They're going to pay better. add another zero, right? <laughs> oh, maybe who knows? Did you hear about Ubiquity? So this is stupid, and I tweeted it because of it's stupid, and this is a real challenge. Uh, Ubiquity, they didn't validate their data, so uh, <laughs> I had actually tweeted about this as well. And as well as things, just because Ubiquity sends me free equipment doesn't mean I won't call them out. And I, you know, I, I'm aware of this. I knew people, as soon as I seen it, I tweeted this out. I'm like, okay, this is, you know, uh, something that's really important. What happened is they didn't validate the input for some of their feeds that they have for their threat and intrusion IDS IPS system, their threat oh and intrusion detection system. And a lot of people have asked me about it. And the system that they built in on the very back end, I dove into a little bit. It's based on Siricata, but they're doing all their own tuning to it. And it's just basic. It's really, really basic. Now, I don't even know, it wouldn't hold up to muster, but it would, as Xavier say, check the box to make the auditor happy. Mm -hmm. And so do you have an IDS system? Sure, we got this ubiquity box and we checked the box. It doesn't give you much control. It doesn't give you much information. And of course, um, they weren't, they're not doing much with it. You know what I mean? They're not really, uh, they're not that validating was one of my, the inputs or anything like that. So that was one of my big reasons why I went over to PFSense was because for one, my IDS and IPS on my USG, which is behind me and just unplugged, uh, it's just sitting there. If anybody wants to buy it, you can come buy it. Um, I have a, a USG Pro actually, and one of the things was <clears throat> when I turned on IDS and IPS, I capped out at 250 megabits per second on a gigabit line. I was like, okay, and and then the second one was. There were things that were firing off that I couldn't tune, right? I could only suppress. And I was like, okay, that's one way to go about it. I couldn't add things. And then they decided to come out with an update and they were like, well, now you can tune on and off based on categories. So if you want anything that's based on media messaging, or if you want anything that's best based on updating or OTA or bad, you know, pilot, corporate policy violation, that was all nice. But they didn't let me go down into the actual rule itself. And 
and kind of turn on and off the different rules for different devices, so to speak, right? And you learn that if you do Syracuse on something like PF Sense or running a separate on security and either one, you learn what it means to be a knock engineer because one, false positives are part of life and uh, you have to do all the tuning manually. Nothing is, you know, everything does require levels of uh, that type of tuning. So, so the, the you take dream the of out. making it automated means somewhere on the back end, Ubiquity didn't put a lot of effort into it, automated it, and didn't validate rules. And now this was the end result. <laughs> Bammo. Blamsky. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's an easy fix. Don't use it. But when people have asked me about it, I just say it. it's there. It exists. Just, yeah. <laughs> it checks the box. But if you think it's secure, it's not. Now, I don't. Uh, let's see what we got. Oh, Asus routers. This uh, isn't too surprising, um, but it's so, basically more more Asus router debauchery for consumer equipment. Like consumer equipment is just garbage right now. Oh, it's, it's just on fire. It's a dumpster fire. And yeah. there's this is just another one. Basically, tons of holes, low cost device. Well, I I can't even see low costs. Um, if you I have an Asus, uh, the AC nineteen hundred P. A high end model. I don't know exactly what that one costs, but it's not cheap. They have the price on it. I haven't looked at consumer prices on these for a while, but it's it's expensive enough that it shouldn't <laughs> it shouldn't have giant holes in it. <laughs> oh, it's a one nineteen, but or is it two seventy nine? You got you're like me. You got all the ads blocked. That sounds more right. I thought these things were right around a couple hundred dollars for that model. Oh, it's a two pack. Okay, so it's about one hundred and forty bucks or so. Yeah, but still, you would expect well, to and, have some. Uh, someone commented in the chat that the high end ones are about three hundred. There are they're all based on the same in, or similar firmware with the similar problems. And Trustway found two vulnerabilities, CVE 2020-15-498 and CVE 2020-15-499 that could have allowed crooks to pull off the double barrel attack. Double uh, bogus barrel. firmware updates because uh, it doesn't check the digital signatures. <laughs> Ouch. What's up with this non-input validation thing going on? Yeah. It's, you oh, know what? wait. It's, it... You mean that that's where the entire attack surface is on hacking? Oh, yeah. 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 If you want to fuck with the system, you got to throw some, some garbage <laughs> at it. <laughs> Scroll down a little bit though, because the 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 first bug seems to have been a simple oversight. Perhaps code um, for testing that was never removed or an insecure left over years ago. But simply put, the router which runs Linux, uh, like many other two devices, used the well-known wgit command <laughs> to mm. organize and download it correctly. Used an HTTPS secure web link, but added non-default command line option dash dash no check certificate. Oh wow. <laughs> So now all I got to do is... Spoof DNS and it doesn't care. Fucking man in the middle your router. Like I already was going to do. Oh, well, man. I could yeah, see and the fact that you could just do no pineapple. check cert. They should have forced that not to be run, so... Oh, man. I want to play with this now. I want to do SSL strip on ACES updates and then go around and try and initiate updates on devices using my Wi-Fi pineapple. That'd be amazing. And this Second is the same thing... Second bug cross-site scripting bug? Yep. Hmm. That's interesting. Validate all your inputs. Yep. And Asus didn't. I, you know, I'm hoping more because Asus for a while, I don't know, it's been a long time since I looked and I, perhaps in my years ago, I did a video on this. We might do something updated on it, but honestly, it's so challenging because people say, why don't you do something on other than PFSense? And I said, to me, PFSense is one of the most affordable routers that home users, without too much effort, for 179 you can get that little box and you can get started with something that's actually secure versus these are just Swiss cheese and poor updates, poor firmware. And even if you get to load something because of the challenges of doing it, like open WRT, by the time you buy that piece of hardware and try to load some of those things on there, it's still, you're, you've got a lot of time and effort into something you can just buy. So I, I'm still trying to find some easier solutions for consumers, but right now Asus isn't it. Uh, neither is Linksys and Netgear and all of them have just a, uh, I think we covered Netgear two shows ago, was just a long, long list of Netgear that all have firmware problems that there's no solid updates for. Um, we'll see if this last link opens. If not, I can just kind of speak to it because it wasn't opening earlier. Is it open on your side? 
No, I mean, I got a copy open, but it's a lot of blank pages. It okay. doesn't have any of the pictures. Um, it's um, got some of the code, but it doesn't have any so, of the figures. Well, this is really interesting, and uh, it was – there's – the, I think it, I, I tweeted this out too. It's the and you can look this up. It's basically F Secure and their published paper. Uh, it's a re- reverse engineering of what uh, turned out to be fake Cisco equipment, mm. and it's really interesting. Now the good news in terms of the market was these are out there, but they are not nefarious. They are just they look like Cisco in every way, and that's what's amazing about them. Like you have to look up close. Like you have to have a genuine Cisco next to the fake Cisco to realize they used a very slightly different screen printing technique. The, the the alignment is like maybe half a millimeter off on little arrows that point to the ports on the, on, on the Cisco. Little tiny details that you can't tell with the naked eye. You almost you have to have a side by side. But when you open it up, then you start seeing the differences. And what they did was there was a previously unknown bug inside of the Cisco firmware that allowed you to get the Cisco firmware to work on non-Cisco boards. They had breadboarded on the bottom of the board, essentially, a chip to keep uh, exploiting certain conditions to stop the validator from validating. Basically, every time the validator checked, it always responded with it. A your your firmware failing. <laughs> so they did this hardware on there. And in their the best appearance is that their goal was to just sell cheaper versions of Cisco in the market so some other company can make the profit. So, But the fact that they had this level of engineering means they they sold these. They got into the open market. They ran Cisco iOS. They got caught because Cisco made some firmware changes, so the new version of Cisco iOS, when loaded, caused these ones to brick. So they call up Cisco support. Hey, man, what's up with these? And that's where the investigation starts going. They're like, that's not Cisco. Yeah, they're like, that looks like a Cisco. But when we open it up, and then what's this extra board on there? So when they started digging further into it, uh, it's just counterfeit. But it's pretty scary that um, they got that far in the market running the genuine firmware and everything else. So that's the part that's... Interesting. Yeah. And how did they get this level of engineering? One, there's a couple options. One, espionage is obviously a possibility that someone got the designs. But the reality is when you have all this stuff made at Foxconn or wherever they're made, some, you know, I'm I'm 99.9% sure without looking, Cisco builds the stuff in China. And we know what China does. If they're building it on a production line, when we're done running the Cisco line, we then go and take and run the Cisco line again, right. uh, as long as it's not in the same plant. Because my understanding from talking to people or listening to people in this industry is they do come over and inspect the places where their stuff is manufactured and things like that, which is why the silk screen printing would have been slightly off. It would have been, That's where those little nuances, they cloned everything down the street, not necessarily in the same building. But I have a feeling the same people probably worked at both buildings. Right. Yeah, no, we're only making genuine Cisco. So you count how many frames of uh, circuit board went in and how many went out. So, you know, there's no counterfeiting there. Sure. But when you have a guy down the street who knows how to operate the same machine, I, it's hard. I mean, I'm speculating as to what happened, but it still happened. And it's kind of scary that it got all the way into the open market uh, in use, installed in racks that in for some period of time before an update was what flagged it because the update failed. Holy so Sheesh. that's a lot. That's that um. That's nuts. That's, that's scary nuts. shit. Yo, because Timothy they found Harris, out how to get around that validator. So yeah, fucking hardware keygen, basically, like a, a hardware crack. Yeah. Oh man, I wonder if I could do that with my Tesla. Ooh. <laughs> well, um, in, so there's there's the speed boost upgrade with Tesla, and that's another thing. I mean, that company in Canada found out how to enable the speed boost without actually doing it. So that's yeah. That's the fun stuff. I mean, I bought That's the, the car. Stuff. You know? Timothy Harris says, what Firefox extensions do you use? I use um, privacy.com for virtual cards, Keybase Chat, um, uh, uBlock Origin, multi-account containers for Firefox, Shodan, LastPass. I got my uh, GNOME shell extensions because that's always amazing. Dark Reader. Um, I use something called Enhancer for YouTube, which allows me to be able to do a bunch of a bunch of things. 
Uh, I, I use a Facebook container so that Facebook doesn't track me all over the place. And then I have Foxy Proxy so that I can turn on BERT. So I, I use quite the number of extensions. Um, I'm an extension guy, but uh, they're all vetted and I, they have a very specific purpose. I use a lot of them, actually. Yeah. The um, one I probably like the most is uh, to do the blocking one. The I think you use it you too. Block yeah, U Block Origin. That's my U -block. yeah, U Block Origin is the one I I always want to make sure I say it right because there's the U Block and U Block Origin. The Origin's the one. So <laughs> eh, U Block Origin, that's the one. And for me, uh, Bitwarden, because I that's for I'm using self hosted Bitwarden for passwords. So. I may actually switch over, I don't know. I gotta figure out. I really out, like it. Like, how do you onboard or offboard from LastPass? Like, it's just difficult. Oh. It oh it's stupid easy. You do the last they have an instruction how to do it. You do the export. Import Bitwarden. See you later, LastPass. It was really? a couple minutes. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Because they I mean, built. Well, they built what about an importer. When my internet goes off. Um, I'll I have self-hosted Bitwarden. I mean, like, what happens when you have a light outage because it's fucking spring in the summer now and it storms? Oh, um, it has the local cached copy. Okay, that's what I need. Also, to hear. it's got a it's got a command line app and it's got a desktop app, and okay. it'll. It, in the event that it can't contact the server, it uses the latest copy it had last time. Okay. So when it can, so for example, on my laptop, obviously my laptop travels with me. It pauses trying to talk to the server. As soon as it times out, it just works. And then uh, it does warn you of conflict. So if I were to do a password update or a change, and mm. it still can't contact the server. It will warn me um, we have a difference because if I also changed it, it'll sync the changes fine, but let's say while it's offline, I synced two different ones, it will have uh, some sync conflicts. I'm trying to remember how they deal with that because I haven't had that happen in a while. Um, I know they did some updates, but it does have like conflict resolution and things like that. But for the most I part- I sync my big warden, my bit warden to my last pass. Like if I could just have an active sync, like sync thing. That way, like whenever There's... my power goes out here, I could just- Doesn't last pass have a command line? I don't know. I don't. Know. Yeah. I, I don't. I haven't had a need for it. Honestly, but about. if you don't want to self-host Bitwarden, they ho they can host it for you. So, oh, they have. They are hosted as well. Yeah, yeah. Their default is they, they host it for you. They should just let me self-host LastPass, and that would just that be. I just uh, like the idea of self-hosted Bitwarden because you know, I know they do all the encryption. But let's say someone attacks Bitwarden or whatever. Well, for me, I'm one layer deeper because you can only get to my Bitwarden behind a VPN on an ACL list of who's accessing it. So um, I have that internal version of it. And like you said, if the power goes out, I'm not worried. And that was one of the first problems I was, before I even self-hosted, all my testing was exactly that scenario. Cause I'm like, yeah. well, I take my laptop and I go to people where I don't have I internet or I may go somewhere. I, <laughs> what if I can't VPN back to my office cause of where I'm at and it's blocked cause of the hotel I'm at, I still need to get in and log in. And it does function. It'll hold a cache copy in the browser. It'll hold a cache copy in the, uh, desktop app and a desktop app is Linux as well as Windows. Mm. In the CLI app, I think they have one for Windows, but they definitely have one for Linux. Uh, it supports yeah. some cool features because yeah, you can yeah. have it. Uh, you can actually have scripts that call and get request passwords out of it if you need certain validation information. So there's ways to make that work. Good old Bitwarden. This episode is brought to you by open source yeah. software. All of it. Go to GitHub.com and download the whole fucking thing. <laughs> yep. Are you? Uh, do you do anything in uh, Rust? Say it again. The Rust language. Golang is my lang of choice, but uh, Rust lang is up there. I, it's, it's on my list of things to to learn after Erlang. So there's also so Bitwarden itself uses uh, Microsoft SQL Server and is a little heavy handed because Ugh. of that. But it's yeah. because of scalability they chose the way they did it. There's also Bitwarden RS, which is a implementation open source that's also done in Rust with some different database options. So um, it's another one you can that I think that one only comes in this that one's only a self-hosted flavor, but is still compatible with the Bitwarden plugin. So it's uh, something else that. you can play with. Uh, if yeah. It's a little bit lighter weight. You know, I always like playing with shit in the lab. We got to we got to do a lab video. Yes, we'll do a lab video on breakdown because how many VMs do you have running now? 54? Oh, 54, 56, something crazy yeah. like that. If you can't Over hear 50 it in the VMs. Back, it's just nuts. It's so warm in here right now. I'm within operating temperature according to spec because I had to go look it up. But but it's warm. Yeah. <laughs> but it's warm in there. <laughs> it's like I get degrees. it. <laughs> it's, it's not nice. Uh, um, who 
else we got on here? What's up, Kane? What's up, Fendrix? What's going on, everybody? Yep, got a few Did people in here. here. Yeah. Oh, we got 40 is... viewers. Awesome. Nice. We don't have 40 likes, so if you guys wow. can smash the like button before you I'm, leave. I'm going to like it, too. Bam! I got a like in there. <laughs> oh, look at it jump. Wow. Holy smokes. It just jumped up from... Woof. Okay. All right. You guys are awake. Well... I think we've come to the end of our of our we show have notes. wound it out to the end. Well, so but... I guess we have some explaining to do. We did have a special guest lined up, and we might he have had clicked a family a incident. We had a family incident. We're going to try and have him next week. I think we're good for next week. He's already confirmed for next week, but Lord willing, all right. We don't want to. You know, who knows what happens? You know? Yeah, but life gets in the way sometimes. Uh, but everything goes well. It, it, we say this all the time, and even our guests. Even our guests have life. Like, you can't beat life. Yeah. Don't even try to. Just let life be life and go with the flow, you know? Yeah, so if you need to take some personal time, you take some personal time. You know, where yeah. it's... <laughs> yeah, he's down with family right now, handling some things. But when he's back next week, we're going to have some extremely fun things to talk about. Yep. And some, uh, some insights on things that no one else in my network that I know and maybe, I don't know about your network, will be able to actually give us, I mean, some things that are juicy. So I'm excited. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a yeah. guest. It's, uh, yeah, I'm excited yeah. about it too, so. Super excited. All right. Okay, so well, we fresh at the cut. Appreciate it, man. It fucking took oh. six months. Yeah, <laughs> he's got the, got it trimmed. I'm aerodynamic <laughs> now. You can see the top of my, uh, you can you can see it was my, it was getting a little out of control for a while. It was nuts, man. I mean, they closed down the barber shops, and then my barber quit cutting hair. He went to go work for Amazon full time, oh. and then uh, other barbers were just flaky. And then the barber I wanted to go to opened up two weeks ago, but his schedule was booked because he only cuts through Thursday through Saturday, and he's scheduled only. And so I finally got on his schedule three weeks later, and uh, it feels so much better. I'm not gonna lie. I couldn't even sleep last night. I was tossing and turning like I need a haircut. I need a haircut. <laughs> uh, feels so much better. Let me drop these lab notes in so people can play for those watching it later. Um, so, and anyone who was at, wondering about it, I got to do them now or I'll forget because that's how I am. Yeesh. Do it now before we end the show. There we go. Save and update. I like that I can save it and update it. So very cool. Check out that. Uh, stay tuned for some more DEF CON news. Keep an eye on Xavier's Twitter. Easy enough guy to follow and find. He's got to be deciphering that thing. Yeah, if anybody wants to help me with magnetic strip data on uh, cassette tapes, if anybody has something that I could pull the data off here. Maybe I don't we'll... have. I am not someone who hoards my old electronics, so I got no tape decks to help you with. I don't know exactly what this code is. But I'm sure you folks out there... It has meaning, me. I'm sure. Oh, yeah, for every little detail does. So. Every detail's got some code in it. Oh, for sure. Uh, Joe Grand is the person that puts these together. He is a well-known member of the community. And uh, I'm super excited to have my DEF CON badge, and I'm going to be playing with it. I got a few more badges on the way. I got the Car Hacking Village badge, and I got, um, I got Car Hacking Village swag coming. So we're going to have stickers and shirts and flags and all this stuff. Um, and then I also have a um, X uh, and X or badge for the first time ever. I made it as a uh, sponsor and I, or as not a sponsor, as a um, philanthropist or whatever, whatever they want to call it. Yeah. I, I donated money and I'm getting an electronic badge and I am extremely nice. excited. It is a prized possession. I'm, I'm into badges, into electronic badges. So if anybody out there is watching and wants to send me badges, Send them to Tom's place. Yep, send them. I'll give them to Xavier. Tom will get them to me. I I move around too much to have a published yeah. location. <laughs> I don't even have a. I'm in a month to month. I'll move tomorrow if I want. <laughs> <laughs> my my building's been here long enough, so it's easy enough. Just uh, drop it, mail it to the address at lawrencesystems.com. It's the only address we have, so yeah. we're easy enough to find. <laughs> yeah, send me some badges. I'm really looking for the shoot badge, the one that has the. Uh, the, sh the shot timer on it, if anybody has that. They're on eBay. If no one has ever gone and checked out uh, DEFCON badges on eBay, they are out there. And they're reselling for 
hundreds of dollars. I mean, four or five hundred dollars sometimes. So some people are collectors of them. People are collectors. People are collectors. Well, I have nothing else for you. It All was right. amazing. It was great. Thank you, everyone who joined us. Uh, look for you. us next week with our special guest, and I'll see you later. Peace. Peace.